Hello, BookTube. I have some Friday mail for you if the, that last video wasn't long enough. <laughs> it's just like these videos are getting longer. That's a problem. Uh, but I thought we'd go through these packages. There are no boxes, but the last one is big. Uh, big and heavy, so who knows what it could be. So we'll do this. Uh, this first. I've got the bean standing by. What have we got here? Oh. Oh, okay, bean, bean, Frida, let me, let me see this for Okay, yes, all right, this is, uh, this is a book that I'm going to be reviewing uh, for the Vineyard Gazette, the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, which you should all subscribe to. It's a wonderful printed newspaper. It's a big broadsheet thing. Uh, it's Island News. Martha's Vineyard, for those of you who maybe don't know, don't live in America, is a, a beautiful island off the coast of Massachusetts uh, that is... Rich in story, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, it's a wonderful place. It's a vacation home now. It's a vacation destination for millions and millions of people every summer. Uh, and then in the winter, it shuts down, mostly. Uh, and uh, the Martha's Vineyard Gazette is the newspaper of the island. And it's a classic small-town newspaper in that it starts off with uh, island news and editorials, and then it goes on for page after page after page of elaborate, lovingly detailed obituaries, <laughs> and then it finishes up with uh, arts, entertainment, uh, authors coming to town, plenty of authors live in the vineyard or, or, uh, or go to visit the vineyard, uh, and at the back page is vineyard gardening, vineyard wildlife, that sort of thing. I think, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only longtime reader of the Vineyard Gazette who reads the back page first, because it's so wonderful. Uh, but the the Vineyard Gazette has a book section called the Vineyard Bookshelf, and I am a mainstay of the Vineyard Bookshelf now. I write I review I write reviews as often as my editor will send me books, uh, and he sent me this one. Uh, so I guess this will be uh, this will be one of my one of my newer my newer books. This is uh, looks uh, self published or subsidy published, and it's about one of the signature tragedies of uh, a part not what is now a part of Martha's Vineyard, and that it's called Chappaquiddick Speaks, and it's by Bill Pinney, in collaboration with what someone called a new witness, Carol Jones. Chappaquiddick is a tiny island that is a part of Martha's Vineyard, and. Uh, it was there that that Edward Kennedy, a young Edward Kennedy, drove a car off a dock uh, into the water, head first into the water. And he got out and he swam to shore and then he made the voyage back to the village uh, and went to bed and never told anyone that he wasn't alone in the car, that Mary Jo Kopechny was in the car as well. And when he spread the word the next day it was too late she was dead he didn't try to save her himself and he didn't get any help to save her when she might have been saved uh is an incredible tragedy you know in in one sense i don't know that anyone can say that they would have behaved better he lost his head he he, he lost his head he panicked uh on the other side Plenty of people would have, plenty of people, especially a young athletic man, would have viewed it as their immediate first priority to save the other life in the car. One way or another, though, uh, the incident at Chappaquinnick is, has been widely and I think rightly seen as the reason why there was no second President Kennedy. Um, and interviewers, of course, danced delicately around it whenever they would talk to Kennedy. He went on to become a, a legendary figure in the U.S. Senate, the lion of the Senate, uh, and had many life turns for good and for ill that were well chronicled in the press. Uh, and I guess this is a new book about about Chappaquiddick. Uh, the back is all uh, blurbs, so I don't I don't really know about the book, but I will I will gladly read it. That's great. Uh, Okay, so if there's a, if the author says there's a new witness, then this may be some sort of uh, reappraisal of what happened at Chappaquiddick. Uh, one way or another, uh, the Vineyard Gazette, quite without knowing, I'm sure that my editor at the Gazette does not know, uh, but there is a there is a large, not a large, but there is a there is a vigorously enthusiastic uh, segment of my readership of people who've been reading me for years. Uh, that knows how, how interested I am in all things Kennedy. I know everything there is to know about them. Uh, and 
waits eagerly because as is true with a lot of things that I know a lot about, the handful, there's probably 10 subjects that I know an inordinate, a, a weird amount about. And as is true with most of them, I end up not writing about them. There are, there are some exceptions, the Tudors, the, the House of Windsor, but in most cases, like for instance, you would be hard pressed to find anything written by me about the Dutch humanist Erasmus. Uh, and the same thing is true with the Kennedys. The, that that vocal group of, of I guess you'd call them fans. They're old friends, most of them. Uh, they they always they periodically say, well, you know, if there's a big new Kennedy book, will you write about it? I want to read your take on this more than I want to read anybody else's. And uh, I usually decline. And unbeknownst to my editor at the Vineyard Gazette, he is now going to get a Kennedy review out of me. Uh, that's interesting. Not what I foresaw. Wonderful. I'll have, to, I'll have to check when it's due and see when I have to get to work. Uh, so what is this next one? Do you want this now? Do you want this next one? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I can see on, on the envelope this is another Vineyard Gazette book. Oh, fantastic. Great. Okay. Uh, this is... Uh, that's a bigger book. It's a, it's heavily illustrated. This is uh, by Everett Crosby, and it is The Making of Nantucket. Uh, Nantucket is another island off the coast of Massachusetts, considerably further away from Boston than Martha's Vineyard is. At the Vineyard, you get on the ferry to the Vineyard. You'll no sooner get settled, start making fun of the tourists, and break out a bag of potato chips than you'll be docking. Whereas Nantucket is further out. <laughs> it's, it's further out. It's a distance. So that a long-time Nantucket residents refer to the United States as the mainland. Uh, and sometimes really old residents of Nantucket will refer to the mainland as the United States. <laughs> they don't view themselves as part of it at all. Nantucket will, uh, was, of course, a, a center for whaling. Uh, and this, I guess, I guess my editor must want to... to uh, I mean, it's kind of local, right? I mean, if you're the editor of the Vineyard Gazette, you could see that your audience would be interested in a book on Nantucket. I could certainly see that. I've spent a lot of time uh, on Martha's Vineyard, and I have also spent a lot of time on Nantucket. I've also spent a lot of time on Nantucket in in the winter, when in the old days, when the whole I am far more so than Martha's Vineyard. The whole island shut down for the winter, and only a core of hardy people managed to go to to win to overwinter on the island. I've done that many times and I've loved it. Absolutely loved it. I love Martha's Vineyard, but I think, I think, uh, Nantucket has an extra special place in my heart. And this is going to be one of the first times I've ever written about it. Wow. What a, what a pair. <laughs> How wonderful. All right. Uh, okay. So we started off, uh, this mail hall with two working commissions. If, if this whole thing is working commissions, then Steve is going to buy himself a new MacBook. <laughs> but I don't think so. Uh, we won't be lucky enough to get any more working commissions, I don't think. Although I have to, I have to admit, uh, there is an extra thrill when you're going through the mail. There's an extra thrill in, uh, in encountering a book that you already know you are going to be writing about for an audience. There's, there's an extra thrill in that. An extra feel of being on guard that I like. Uh, Cardboard baby, we'll just we'll, there you go. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right, so what have we got here? Uh, okay, this is uh, a novel, I think. It, yeah, it's a novel. It's called One Another, and I don't know. Can you, can you read the author's name? I can't really because of the crappy cover design. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if the pub sheet tells us. This is by someone named Monique Schwitter. That is certainly not legible on that cover, but that's all right. Maybe she agrees with that. Uh, let's see here. This is, comes out in February, uh, and it's been tra translated from the German by Tess Lewis. Uh, this has been shortlisted for the German Book Prize and is was the winner of the Swiss Book Prize. And it's, I guess, a debut. It introduces a bold new voice to world literature, so maybe this is a debut novel. Uh, in a moment of writer's block, an unnamed narrator Googles her first love and learns he has committed suicide years ago. Shaken by this discovery, memories of him flood her mind. Okay, all right. The memories weren't shaken. Uh, uh, so... As she is shaken by this discovery, memories of him flood her mind, as well as memories of other loves who followed. 
questions arise, too, about the nature of love, why it comes and goes, and what is happening in her relationship with her present love, her husband, a father of her two sons. In an effort to understand, she begins to write her personal history of love, reliving different experiences, one lover after another. Unexpectedly, as story after story unfolds, the narrator's orderly pursuit becomes chaotic. The past and present entangle on the page, and the present-day complications of love and a startling event overlooked at home finally take over the plot of her life and art. Interesting. Okay. So Monique Schwitter uh, was born in 1972 in Zurich and now lives in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and she is the award-winning author of novels, short stories, and plays. Oh, so this isn't a debut. This might be an English language debut. Uh, Goldfish Memory, published in 2015, her most recent collection, is her only other work in English translation. Okay, so... And so this, this isn't. So she's written many novels and many plays, and she's already had a novel translated into English, and she's won. She's been. She's won a major award. So why the pub the pub sheet calls her a bold new voice in world literature? I don't know. Uh, what do you have to do to be an old voice if she hasn't done it already? Uh, but one way or another, the novel sounds wonderful, uh, and that comes out. What did we mention? That comes out next year, February. Okay. So I don't have to. I don't have to worry about this for the time being. Uh, although Monique Schwitter, now I'm wondering, those of you who, who uh, are up on your German literature, Britta, do, who is Monique Schwitter? Do you know this author and do you like her? Uh, I, she's totally new to me. Uh, all right, let's see. Let's move on. Here. You're already... You're already being... Oh, no, you're... <laughs> no. You're sitting there so dainty. All right, well, I will pick her up and show her to you. She's not jumping again. Uh, okay, so, uh, all right, so this is a finished copy. This comes out in early November. Uh, I think it's a novel, uh, although it doesn't say. Uh, it it breaks, breaks with the tradition of having a novel on the front cover, but I think it is. This is by Helen Klein Ross, and this is a finished copy of The Late Covers. Uh, 16-year-old Bridie is running away from her small town. It's 1908, and her sweetheart dies suddenly on their ocean crossing from Ireland to America. I was hoping that would happen to me, but Deb survived. <laughs> uh, leaving Bridie alone and pregnant. Uh, and the latecomers opens there and follows the thread of her life as she impacts the future of the New England blue blood family she works for, unspooling into a riveting multi-generational novel. Packed with rich and detailed history, romances, and dark secrets, the latecomers spans more than a century of American history. A tale of immigration, motherhood, and female agency, and reminds us that we can never truly leave the past behind. Okay, and this is by Helen Klein Ross. Who is Helen Klein Ross when she's at home? Uh, she's the author of two previous novels. She's also the creator of The Traveler's Made Vecum, an anthology of new poems titled by old telegrams. Her poetry, essays, and fiction have appeared in The New Yorker, New York Times, and literary journals. She spent decades as a writer and creative director at global ad agencies on both coasts. Interesting. Okay, uh, so this comes out in the first week of November, like everything else in the world. So this is uh, this is now on my radar. Uh, unlike the uh, the Monique Schwitter book, this thing has to be read. So I will I will uh, put this on the docket to read relatively soon. Uh, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> there we go. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, this is. I believe we might have seen this already. Uh, this is an advanced copy of... I wonder if this is a double. I think it is. This comes out in March of next year, so I don't have to worry about it. It's a historical novel. And it's The Wolf and the Watchman by Nicholas... Uh, who is this author? Nicholas Not Akdag, which means night and day. Uh, I think we saw, we saw this already, right? Uh, well, it... In, it is 1793. When a night watchman finds a mutilated body in the city's foulest lake, he works alongside the brilliant lawyer-turned-police investigator to establish the identity of the dead man and becomes embroiled in a world of tricksters, thieves, con artists, and killers. As this story intersects with that of a young girl condemned to the workhouse and a handsome farmer's son whose gambling debts force him to commit unspeakable acts, 
The novel explores the darkness lurking in every human. Yeah, I think I have a... No, I have, I, this, is, uh, this is the author's first novel, and uh, it's been translated into English. Yes, or did he write this in English? Terrible that I don't know these things. I don't remember if... Uh, I don't remember if this came out in uh, in German first or in Swedish first. It was originally published in Sweden, in Swedish. Um, and no translator is listed that I can find. Uh, so maybe he translated, maybe he wrote it in English himself. Maybe he, this is, is his own work. Uh, but one way or another, this comes out in the spring. Uh, and it's a, it's a historical murder mystery, so it's, it's fine by me. Uh, again, I like the with the, the Schwitter book. I don't have to worry about it yet. But uh, and then we got this last one, uh, which is nice and heavy. Could be a big finished copy. Of something. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic! Okay, I don't know if we saw this on this channel before, but I uh, I loved this book. Absolutely loved it. I heartily recommend it. Uh, so this is great. I'll get to talk to you about it, whether I whether I do or not. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is Rampage uh, by James Scott, and is about the Battle of Manila. Uh, in, on March 11th, 1942, under cover of darkness and in the face of advancing Japanese forces, General Douglas MacArthur escaped the Philippines with his family and staff, the incident of the famous I Shall Return. Uh, he left behind fighting troops, United States citizens, and the Filipino people. Uh, nearly three years later, MacArthur returned to the Philippines determined to secure a route for an eventual strike on the Japanese homeland and to wipe away his flight's taint of disgrace. Uh, in Manila, his advance crashed up against a rogue Japanese officer who, in defiance of orders to withdraw, decided that he and his men would fight to the death, and in so doing would slaughter thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Uh, in this book, the celebrated author of Target Tokyo delivers the definitive history of the monstrous 29-day battle to liberate the Philippine capital and its immediate aftermath. And the aftermath includes the trial, and the trial is gripping. It's as gripping as any of the blood and guts uh, gore that happens before it. This is just an amazingly sustained performance in popular narrative history. Uh, before World War II, Manila was known as the Pearl of the Orient, a city boasts a mix of stately Spanish colonial and neoclassical architecture, a wealth of cultural resources, and a vibrant international community. In the opening months of the Pacific War, Japanese forces advanced rapidly throughout the region, including the Philippines. General MacArthur escaped capture, uh, but uh, thousands of soldiers and U.S. citizens were not so lucky. Apprehended American civilians and other internationals in Manila were rounded up and detained in Santo Tomas internment camp. At first, the internees fashioned a working community out of the diverse and unlikely population thrown together, but the Japanese neglect slowly turned the camp into a grisly daily struggle against starvation and disease. And those scenes are harrowing in this book. Um, American forces rallied from the initial shock of the aggressive Japanese offensive and began the long, bloody struggle of pushing the Japanese tide back. Though many in the U.S. military felt the, an effective push for Tokyo could leapfrog over the Philippines, in other words, not do it at all, just skip them, uh, MacArthur had promised the people of the Philippines, I shall return. Victory wasn't going to come easily. Facing brutal losses throughout the Pacific, the Japanese high command had put General Tomoyuki Yamashita in charge of the Philippines, known as the Tiger of Malaya. For his surprising victory over a large force of entrenched British troops in Singapore, Yamashita saw his deployment to the Philippines as a death sentence and had no delusions about facing off against MacArthur. He ordered a series of strategic retreats, uh, but neither he nor MacArthur could have predicted the fateful decision of Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi, ordered to sabotage key military resources and retreat. Iwabuchi diso disobeyed his orders and, inspired by the example of Stalingrad, decided to fight the advancing Americans to the death. Worse, he ordered his troops to treat any civilians they encountered as an enemy. Uh, with pre gruesome, predictable results. This is just an amazing book. Uh, a couple of years ago, I noticed that that it was it was really a marquee year for World War II history, uh, and 19, uh, 2018 hasn't quite been that, but there have been some wonderful uh, some wonderful exceptions, and this is one of them. So, I mean, I I will gladly now that I have another copy of this, I will gladly reread chunks of it. But I also want to recommend it if I haven't done that already on this channel. I want to recommend it if you know 
the the Pacific Theater of World War II, or if you know someone who reads books like this, this is a must read. Just incredible. And also, uh, in, in a slightly rare case for books that are called groundbreaking by their publishers, this actually is groundbreaking. No one's ever done this kind of sweeping synthesis before. Uh, so this is really the place to start on the whole subject. Just an amazing book. Just amazing. Uh, wonderful. What a great way to end this mail haul. All right, so that is our, uh, our Friday mail haul here. We have Rampage. Uh, by James Scott. We have The Wolf and the Watchman by Nicholas Not Akdag. Uh, we have The Latecomers by Helen Klein Ross, another novel. We have One Another, uh, a novel by Monique. I, I cannot, her name is Schwitter, I remember, but I can't read it on the cover. Uh, and then we have two, uh, two, no, two books that I will be re reviewing, so I will, I will alert you when that happens, although you wouldn't need an alert if you just subscribe to the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, would you? <laughs> anyway, uh, the first one is The Making of Nantucket, not about the vineyard at all, but about the vineyard's sister island. Uh, and then the other one is Chappaquiddick Speaks, a new book on the tragedy at Chappaquiddick, on Ted Kennedy and the tragedy at Chappaquiddick, which I already said yes, so I will be writing a Kennedy review. That almost never happens, but it's going to happen this year. So uh, so there you go. That is our, uh, our Friday mail. Uh, so I'll wrap this up because I have delayed you long enough with all of these nattering videos. Uh, but I'll be back. We have plenty to talk about tomorrow, including NaNoWriMo. <laughs> so I'll, we'll reconvene then and we'll talk more. Thank you, BookTube.